talk to Raeva. She will be talking about labor mobility and informal practices. Uh, the format of our presentation is usually that uh, our speaker delivers uh, talks for three, five, uh, 40 minutes, and then we have a, a Q&A session. So Dr. Raeva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, everybody, for inviting me and for interest in my works. And Dina, also, thank you very much for organizing this. Um, I'm very happy to speak here because um, um, I remember my last visit in Astana. I think it was 2018, also uh, on the issues of migration. So. <laughs> where I already actually uh, started, uh, these ideas came about about this book. So it's very uh, fortunate that I'm um, I'm given a chance to present our work today, uh, our book, which came out last year. And um, I also understand that uh, Dina, you didn't uh, tell me uh, about the audience, but I guess I would understand that. The audience is uh, largely uh, coming from political science or uh, sociological uh, sciences, I guess, right? So I'm anthropologist. And, Mostly public and administration <laughs> and economics, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I will be maybe speaking from a minority kind of <laughs> a side of uh, very common themes that I all of us are interested. Um, also, we use very different kind of analytical lens and different kind of methodologies, but I think um, the questions that interest all of us uh, could maybe uh, um, form this, a nice discussions at the end of uh, also um, our disciplinary backgrounds are very different. But, um, but the book I'm also presenting today is also... Uh, uh, I, I edited it to dig together with uh, my colleague and friend uh, uh, Rustam Jan Urumbay, who ha has, uh, I think, diverse disciplinary background. And our book has also very diverse contributions and not only from anthropologists. So I think, therefore, I think our book offers kind of uh, a wider kind of uh, opportunities for a wider audience. So I'm really glad about it. Um, so I would like to share uh, some slides to make uh, my life easier, I guess. Um, just a minute, I think this is this one. I think you can see my presentation now, right? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So this is uh, the title of the book that we edited together with uh, Oren Bayev last year. And um, yeah, before I will uh, get into the book and uh, how it came about, I would like to uh, introduce myself briefly um, and where I'm coming from and uh, what kind of luggage I'm carrying. So I... Um, I did my PhD uh, with Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology uh, starting 2005 and um, my um, doctoral research was on migration. I took uh, Uzbekistan as a case study and, um, and the result of this uh, research ended, uh, resulted in a book um, that I uh, published in 2016 on Uzbekistan. Um, so um, since then, I published on uh, very diverse topics, uh, including um, starting from um, informal economies. Uh, now I'm doing some uh, a special issue on debt economies or debt relations. Um, my past research, uh, which I just finalized as I'm speaking, is on uh, migration and Islam in Russia. Uh, they also did some uh, small researches on religious markets. So we edited a special issue on halal markets. Um, and I wrote several things on entrepreneurship and female entrepreneurship and gender 
um, focusing on Central Asia, Russia, and Caucasus. So these are the topics and uh, themes that have been uh, covered uh, within my research. And as I said, I'm anthropologist. And uh, currently I'm um, doing my habilitation uh, and lecturing also at uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in München, uh, where I um, just finalized my uh, book two. So it's not yet out, but I hope it will be out with some kind of good presses, but first I have to defend it as a thesis. It has a, a, a thesis form right now, um, habilitation at the university. So, um, so this book is finished and, um, and, I, and basic, uh, the most of the material and thinking comes of course largely from this research that I did in Russia. Um, since 2016, and I mean, Rustam Aurumbayev also does uh, his research, did also his research in Russia and uh, lately in Turkey, so he was also very much anthropologically, I mean, he's a legal scientist and he's also anthropologically was engaging uh, with the regions. Um, and he just now edited, by the way, another book uh, with uh, another also uh, within this uh, volume, another book on uh, comparing uh, Central Asian migration in Russia and Turkey, which is really um, offers also very much ethnographic and anthropological insights into um, migration from Central Asia in general. So. I really recommend that. I think you will hear more about this new book uh, of my co-author very soon, I guess, because it's just out now in these days. So um, his research, his research and my research, um, I mean, his interests are in um, legal aspects. And uh, I mean, he does also, he applies also ethnographic methods I also, we, we do the same research, but he did, did, I think, more research on Central Asian migration because he also lately did more ethnographic research in Turkey as well. So um, the idea, the book that I'm presenting today that we edited together with him, um, it was, it came like in 2018 where we started discussing um, uh, common themes because we were doing uh, the same research in the same region but he continued then uh, to Turkey uh, so we were meeting in the meetings and then uh, we organized an event together um, because we wanted to look systematically into uh, the link between mobilities and informality since I was as I said uh, was working was working uh, on the themes of informality informal practices uh, informal economies uh, when I was doing both researches uh, for my doctoral dissertation and also for my habilitation uh, thesis uh, in Russia. Um, I was uh, interested in those topics. So we organized this event together and um, we invited very diverse uh, scholars from very different disciplines and um, background and uh, who were dealing with all kinds of issues concerning uh, migration, mobilities, and informal practices. And, and not all contributions entered uh, with, uh, in the book um, because uh, not all contributions were rife uh, or had uh, ready papers. So this became a very, uh, still a very rich empirical material that we have been lucky to collect together. And um, we organized the book, um, we organized the book around our common themes and common interests, looking systematically into this link um, between mobility, mobilities in general and um, informality. So before I um, stop uh, more on uh, more on the details of our framework and um, the the contents of the book, I would like to um, I would like to stop on some of the issues that 
um, were interesting for me. And just to give the, um, some, some a little bit of background of the uh, processes that we are considering within this book. Um, so I, as I said, I, uh, my field research material comes from uh, the regions, both re uh, three regions, three bigger regions, Russia, Central Asia, and Caucasus. Um, and uh, Rustam himself did also uh, research in Central Asia, Russia and Turkey. So these are the contexts that we are coming from. And um, so, as I said, um, informality, I mean, if you, if you generally um, think about informality and in generally about the process of informalization of societies and economies, and uh, look at some kind of uh, statistical numbers or some kind of representations of these processes, um, globally, you can see how much, um, how much of the global character this same very complex process uh, took uh, meanwhile. So, I mean, uh, looking at this map, for example, on informal economies and uh, looking uh, the darker the colors are, the, uh, the more, I think, the percentage of GDP which are brought uh, through informal economies or informal uh, exchange, economic exchange. So obviously the world is, is getting darker um, <laughs> if we talk about inform informal economies, obviously. And these are another kind of representation um, of the same process in in, in, in more gray or dark colors. Uh, also, I think uh, within percentages, I mean, I'm not friend with uh, percentage, but I think this kind of representations and numbers can tell us some things about some uh, complex processes, obviously. Um, so when, when thinking about the informalization in general, I think uh, what comes to, to analytical mind is that one can consider informalization in terms of undocumented labor, in terms of uh, capital circulation. Uh, we can consider informalization in terms of political fields and level of criminalization of the states and corruption, of course. Um, these are the, uh, at least those aspects of informalization that have been um, um, I have been considering in my own research and also uh, Rustam Orumbay have considered uh, uh, more legal also aspects and other aspects uh, of informality, um, including undocumented labor, um, including uh, political fields, criminalization of uh, also state structures and corruption practices. I think uh, also his previous book on um, uh, dealing with migration, I think uh, it's called Hybrid Legal Regimes that he just uh, published with, I think, if I'm not mistaken, with the Cornell University Press. It's really, uh, I recommend it's a very rich ethnographic material which shows this kind of practices or informal practices. And um, his analysis of this kind of um, legal systems which really accommodate or integrate this kind of informal practices uh, and this kind of boundaries between legality and what is uh, illegal and what is legal are really getting blurred. It's really empirically very nicely shown in his book. Um, so we, I, I think it's also in open access that you can just uh, freely download his books. So um, what about the context that uh, we are dealing with, or at least uh, uh, what we dealt, uh, as we dealt uh, in our research at least. So we deal with the context of um, post-colonial uh, situation or global south uh, in the post-Cold War period, which is maybe outdated anyway with a, a new uh, development of uh, Cold War relations. Cold War kind of relations today, um, starting this year uh, with the crisis and uh, war in Ukraine. So we, this and, and and we are we are also dealing with the context where um, the migration um, taking place in Marseille, 
uh, in masses, or if you consider uh, migration to Russia, for example, it's uh, at least, uh, I think it's in millions, if it's not more than 10 million migrants uh, in Russia. So we are also dealing with uh, global capitalization or the context of globalization of capital, uh, which of course indicates to interdependencies between uh, different kind of countries with different background. Um, so obviously it's high mobility, it's a, it's a context of high mobility where uh, time and space are compressed. So these are the aspects uh, which are very um, interesting to consider when one uh, wants to think or analyze uh, mobile situations and informal practices. Or at least this is, these are the contexts that we are considering in our research, um, in the research of uh, Warren Bayev, uh, my co-editor, co and the research of the contributors, contributors of our book. Uh, what kind of processes we uh, uh, we are analyzing or we analyzed also and not only in our research but also in our book are the uh, we are um, we are observing uh, deter deterritorialization. I'm not the first one to use this concept. I think this uh, this is also a new not new concept at all. Uh, we are dealing with uh, destatizing uh, or uh, or retreat of states. Uh, I mean, the, the literature on states, I mean, I think uh, you are most familiar with, uh, is very huge, obviously. Um, we also, uh, there is also a, a huge literature on deregulation who talk about um, uh, unfunctionality of state legal systems and uh, etc. So we all, there is uh, <laughs> there is also then uh, another literature who talking about the re-regulation uh, and and coming of the states back and reordering or uh, other kind of theories for applying uh, space uh, theories for example and etc. So the processes that we are dealing with and the context are obviously not <laughs> very easy and very complex. So, um, um, so we, I think we cannot also, of course, include uh, all of the examples which can explain uh, everything that we would like to explain in relation to informal practices and uh, mobilities obviously. But at least if we are uh, conscious about the processes, if we are conscious about what kind of context we are analyzing, I think we can, we could, or we are, we, we are able to shed some light into some very difficult questions that we are asking in our book. I already wrote about these things, so I would not take much time um, uh, on these very complex issues uh, that I that I'm uh, talking about, um, you can I think also download uh, some of my publications on also um, all of the publication I guess of uh, Rustam Orumbayev are openly accessible. My texts are accessible. You can download them from ResearchGate for free, and I have uh, written about this some at least of these topics already um, in form of, uh, as, I, as I said, books or um, journal articles or chapters in, in the books. So you can, as I said, find um, those publications in uh, research, my, my research kit um, page for free. Um, so to book contents and um, how did we organize the book? I mean, um, as I said, uh, since we, um, we had so many contributions and since we have very different people, uh, scholars with very different backgrounds and with uh, very different uh, disciplinary backgrounds and also very different interests. Also, I mean, the topic was uh, uniting the, not only the event, but also our discussions 
as a result of the event that we organized at the Lund University. Um, so we would, were discussing very diverse topics, but we were all united uh, by our interests in informal practices, in informal economies, and migration. And um, so as a result of, um, this was a very big event, of course, in Lund University. We had uh, also uh, very uh, diverse panels and contributors, but um, discussions evolved, of course, um, resulted in very, very, <laughs> also went also in very different uh, directions. Um, so we tried to, um, to organize um, this diversity somehow uh, so that um, our book somehow uh, makes a systematic contribution somehow. Uh, somehow we try to explain uh, the link between informality and mobility, but we are not, but we don't claim that we, um, we, uh, we offer a, a ready uh, a model for explaining the link between informality and mobilities in general. But we, this is our attempt to deal with this uh, systematically. And um, that's how our book is organized, I think. And I think it was successful in this regard. As I said, we don't offer any kind of ready concepts. We don't uh, offer any kind of ready series to analyze uh, uh, mobilities and uh, informalities. Um, but as I said, we offer uh, critical thinking, or at least um, a kind of uh, constructive start to think about these things. Um, so if you look at um, the book, we, uh, we gave a lot of weight to uncertainty. Um, so obviously, uh, when you think about mobilities and um, I mean the mobility uh, literature or uh, theorizing mobility in general is already huge. Also, it was, it is not so old, but it's already uh, has huge literature by now, starting from Uri, I guess. Um, and, and this, if you look at the literature, I mean, they uh, discuss uh, mobility as a very complex and fluid process, which is very difficult to grasp. But uh, if, if it doesn't offer us with concepts that with concepts or frameworks that we cannot explain um, this kind of complicated and fluid process, uh, why do we need this? I think um, in my to my mind, mobility is this kind of turn or mobility's turn, I think, is defined by an attempt to uh, critically reconsider uh, our thinking about uh, our analysis in general, I guess. I think uh, when you have a mobile process, I think um, rigid uh, concepts or binaries uh, stopped working, stop working. That's why I think um, it's a very healthy approach to uh, reconsider our concepts, reconsider our series, because obviously um, in such a mobile and such a changing world, I think it's uh, these concept, concepts that we are used to apply are kind of becoming difficult. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's the potential of, um, of this thinking and this, uh, rightly called mobility turn uh, in social sciences that we have to reconsider our think analytical thinking in general. So that's a kind of a start of our thinking about uh, not only migration, but uh, mobility in general. And there, when you think about, uh, of course, we, we are considering here uh, mobile uh, human beings, and uh, human beings are social beings, obviously, uh, who are embedded in a social context, social cultural, cultural contexts, uh, where safely uh, brought up. And when a human being starts living these safety 
these safe locations of home, obviously um, this kind of uncertainty starts to um, become more dominant or more relevant in one's life. And that's, and that's, that's why we gave uncertainty um, more weight in the book, because um, I think um, uncertain, I mean, the anthropology of uncertainty is a coming new field. I mean, there is not so much written about uncertainty, and it's still predominated uh, by uh, such discipline, quantitative disciplines, which are, I think, uh, it's very predominantly uh, considered within macroeconomics, I think, economics who are uh, dealing with a series of uh, somehow quantify uh, predictability, I guess. Uh, but in social sciences or anthropology of uncertainty, uh, to consider doubt, I think there is some literature on doubt, but this is another aspect of uncertainty. What interests us is um, Uncertainty is, is, is a situation or condition which is not only um, it can be analytically considered as something negative which or negative condition which uh, one experiences, but also um, used as a capital by others, those who, who are in the position to use um, and abuse uh, this kind of condition of uncertainty. Uh, which results uh, very largely in precarity, for example. Um, here we are talking about precarious situation of migrants, uh, precarity maintained by those in power who benefit from the same precarity, from the same uncertainty. And that's, that's, that's the aspect that uh, interests us and were interesting also in the uh, contributions also. Uh, so, so we gave a lot of weight on that. Then we also deal with the boundaries. As I said, I'm not friend of uh, binaries or uh, rigid kind of understanding or explanation of any kind of boundaries. But I think um, thinking about uh, how the boundaries can blur, I think, can also uh, offer us some kind of explanation for some kind of practices which are uh, very uh, difficult to grasp. So uh, here, I think uh, it's a lot of uh, work from, I think, uh, Rumbayev, his own research. Um, he's talking about, for example, I think in his contribution on uh, digital boundaries, which be, go beyond national boundaries. Uh, I think he's talking about also digital mahalas, which are created um, through smartphone uh, connections and communication. Um, so, so this this part of the book is dealing uh, with this kind of um, boundaries, crossing boundaries. Um, where where the national boundaries help what, to explain what kind of processes. I mean, uh, the we, when we were editing the book, it was uh, it was twenty, I think nineteen twenty. So it's already two years. <laughs> so I cannot uh, give exact details of each contribution, but um, but I, I I try to explain the 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 general organization of the book. But this uh, piece of Urumbayev, uh, I remember at least uh, nice uh, argumentation of this, I think, digital mahalla, I think it was the concept, which was very, I, I remember the, the, the empirical examples. It's really, I, I recommend uh, his ethnographic material is really rich. Um, so you can, I mean, the book is available online. Uh, for free so we can access and I really uh, recommend uh, uh, reading really carefully uh, the chapters. So another part we devoted to uh, state practices uh, which deal with um, mobilities. As I said, um, mobilities obviously um, are very difficult to grasp and uh, when and, I, and, and we are convinced that uh, 
uh, here in this part, we are talking about the state practices. We are convinced that uh, whatever infrastructures are there, if it's uh, uh, if these are uh, migration infrastructures, if these are the state legal systems, if these are uh, border management infrastructures, uh, we are convinced that these kind of infrastructures can, in such in such an amount of mobility, they cannot accommodate all of these mobilities, and there is therefore um, actors who are um, mobile actors are uh, entrepreneurial and innovative to find other ways to organize their lives, their projects, their life projects, and their economic activities. And um, that's, that's, that's how um, mobility marries with informality, I guess, to our mind. So here in this part, we are trying to bring some examples of this kind of state informal in practices. So, I mean, I can understand you could maybe have uh, some kind of confusion if if the state of if the practices are taking place in state offices there there must be no informality uh, but obviously uh, real life uh, shows us other things which uh, always uh, tell us that uh, obviously formal and informal cannot be really separated and boundaries are getting blurred and we are bringing here examples of uh, state practices of how things are managed and dealt with. Um, yeah, to the literature a little bit. Um, so what are the, uh, the literature that could be, uh, could explain some of the processes that we considered in our book? I mean, in, our, uh, in my own research, I uh, use some of the uh, literature that are there. I mean, there is a, a huge literature on informal economies, of course. Um, these are mainly based on um, African examples, Latin American examples. Um, there is a huge literature on uh, state, as I said, as I already mentioned. Um, Legal pluralism is another um, um, part of the literature which, which could explain some of the uh, systems which are, uh, which can explain some kind of regulation outside of state regulation. Uh, so this literature, for example, considers the situations where different kinds of different modes of regulations are at work. Uh, so this literature uh, covers uh, legal plur pluralism, so-called. Um, so there is also some literature on criminalization of states. And there is also a literature on patron-client relations. Um, these are uh, very classical anthropological literature on, uh, on the same issues, I think, uh, you might be using other theories uh, within your disciplines, uh, which consider states and uh, non-state governance. I guess uh, state governance and politics um, have also a very different uh, set of uh, theories. Um, but in my work and also partly in this book, uh, we considered um, largely anthropological literature or at least the literature which uh, uses um, qualitative methodology. Um, some of the arguments that we advanced in the book is, of course, um, um, as I said, uh, we um, gave a lot of weight to uncertainty and precarity. There we used uh, some of the literature on uh, anthropology of uncertainty um, and some of the literature on the risks, like, for example, Beck and uh, precarity uh, and um, you did Butler on precarity, for example. And we also showed that um, there is uh, informalization of economy is, uh, sh is structurating and uh, shaping 
uh, what I also called in my uh, other publications as micro orders with their own uh, norms and social order, uh, where we where you can find, as I said, this kind of patron client relations where kinship and other uh, trust networks uh, or, or social networks or safety networks, also we can find the literature on safety networks is, um, is relevant. So as I said, uh, um, these orders stretch be obviously beyond uh, one national boundary and have transnational character. I talked already about the, uh, that we have uh, uh, given a lot of weight to um, boundaries, uh, um, to national boundaries, so geographic uh, boundaries, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, practices like state and non-state boundaries or formal or informal boundaries. So uh, we tried to kind of, uh, apply spatial approach so that we could include a lot um, diverse uh, practices uh, which are not uh, just uh, uh, compartment com compartmentalized within uh, national boundaries or uh, so these are very diverse examples so we try to uh, open up the analytical framework so that we can accommodate all all these uh, diverse examples and practices. Um, the context, as I said, uh, we have um, post-Soviet, we have examples, uh, I think it's a predominantly post-Soviet context, but we also have uh, examples from uh, German, uh, Germany and Eastern Europe. So, here, of course, uh, visa, uh, uh, visa free zones is uh, relevant because obviously uh, migrants don't have to apply for visa. For example, uh, in the example of um, in the example of Central Asian migration to Russia, uh, there is no uh, visa restrictions. And in the example of Germany, uh, for Polish workers, there is also uh, no visa restrictions. Uh, so the mobility is uh, obviously uh, freely possible. Um, in the post-Soviet context, we have some uh, issues concerned uh, with registration, uh, which obviously limits some uh, access to basic welfare and social services. And of course, corrupt legal and government system is not only relevant for post-Soviet context, but also <laughs> Uh, for German context, um, I mean, usually uh, corruption or any corruption or criminalization is always uh, automatically assigned to uh, either developing countries or post-Soviet spaces, but obviously, uh, or also about in, uh, the, the informality is also always uh, or automatically is uh, assigned to developing and, and not developed countries, but obviously the our examples, for example, from Germany indicate that um, these are not unique only to these countries, but also um, can be observed in the West. Um, I said uh, about the theoretical framework and I explained how we organize the volume, so I don't uh, spend too much time on that. I think I used already much of my time, but um, that's how our book is organized. So I'm really uh, looking forward uh, to your comments. I can say, of course, I cannot uh, defend each and every chapter in our book, but I hope that uh, with this book, we, uh, we could shed some at least light into understanding of this very complex processes of informalization and mobility. Um, as I said, I hope that uh, you find our book interesting and it's accessible, as I said, freely, as our, also other, our, our other texts and the, the books of uh, Orem Baev, my co-author. So um, you're welcome also uh, to write us after maybe you read other stuff as well. So thank you very much for your um, patience to listen so long and 
um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Thriva. You covered a lot of ground and incredibly you, you were within the, the time. So you did a, a double masterpiece to cover a lot of ground in the proper amount of time. So the, excellent. Uh, I think uh, if you don't mind, we would like to open up uh, for question and answer so that uh, we can dig deeper a little bit uh, on some issues. Uh, the floor is open. Okay. Professor Knox. Um, maybe Professor Sharipova is going to respond. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, Professor Sharipova. No, no, it's okay. Yes, okay. Thank you, Rano, for your, for your presentation and for the interesting topic. I think that it's um, um, very timely, and uh, the book opens up actually a new venue for the debates about informality. Of course, uh, there are many books now written about like informality in different areas, but uh, you discuss. Uh, the uh, linkages between uh, mobility and informality. Uh, so it kind of provides a uh, different angle on how people, uh, different ideas and objects move around and uh, interact uh, with the local context. I think that I have like a couple of questions. So uh, my first question is, uh, how do you basically um, not define, but um, uh, how do you view uh, informality? Whether it, it is a positive or negative in your book? because uh, you argue that informality can reinforce inequality, right? Reinforces inequality. But there is also an argument, as far as I know, in other contexts, for instance, in African context, and I'm familiar with the book by my uh, former professor who um, looked at the you know, medical services and uh, argued that informality, in fact, can increase uh, equality. Uh, or access to certain goods that are not accessible through the formal institutions. So how would you define informality in your like volume, whether it is positive or negative uh, on the one hand? So uh, this is one thing. Uh, another one, uh, so you looked across different regions. So how would you probably explain uh, to what extent are they different or similar in terms of informality and mobility? I understand that uh, informality might be context specific, but can you just maybe uh, provide some, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, white strokes of, uh, you know, I, um, a general picture of uh, what are the differences uh, across these regions? So this is it so far. Thank you very much. Now you asked a very difficult question, but <laughs> I tried to <laughs> answer it. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the uh, literature on informal, in, in informal economies, at least, um, I mean, informality is, uh, informality in, in general, the literature is very huge. I mean, starting from even quantitative approaches to qualitative research. I mean, there are books and books written on uh, not only informality, but informal economies. I mean, anthropological literature and informal e uh, economies is very established. And if you look at this uh, whole uh, literature, uh, you're right, there are, you can divide it into two camps. Uh, one camp is um, approaching informality as something negative, um, highlighting uh, exploitation. Um, since you have, when you have the, con uh, the context without contract, and insurances, of course, uh, the, uh, the chances uh, for exploitation, human trafficking, human rights issues are very, very high. Um, these are uh, one camp which highlights this kind of uh, consequences. Uh, so you can already uh, read it from uh, such definitions as shadow economies or underground and other kind of properties used um, for the same uh, process. And there is, of course, also uh, the positive camp or, or the camp uh, who uses a more positive sides of the same, uh, of the same process, uh, which uh, uh, accentuates on agency and possibilities, uh, at least and, and, and largely in the context where uh, formal channels are kind of uh, 
marginalizing or excluding others where they then uh, have other niches to occupy and uh, what kind of opportunities are there and what kind of agency and other uh, aspects are highlighted within this camp. And then you asked a very difficult question. You said, where, which camp do you belong to? <laughs> um, I don't think that I belong to, to any of this camp, I think because uh, I recognize both aspects and I um, observe both problems and both things. And I see both advantages and disadvantages of um, this very complex process. So I think, uh, I think uh, how I do it by not assigning myself to neither of these camps, I think, giving the uh, weight to uncertainty, where I emphasize also the other sides of uncertainty, which gives others, we, where others view the same uncertainty as capital, whereas the other side views uncertainty as something negative, is I think a way to kind of balance, uh, balance this kind of, uh, uh, equation or approach so you consider both sides and um, and we also as I said um, <laughs> unfortunately we don't uh, offer a, a ready model or ready uh, definition of informality which is best uh, we, we, which we, we would claim as best but we try to deal with the existing literature, we try to deal with uh, uh, some aspects that we found important. And I think that's a good start uh, of, of further conversation about the same problems. And I don't, and I, I, I also don't believe in, um, in final, uh, I think, uh, explanations or causal explanations, for example. I, I'm very much against of this kind of uh, cause, causality explanations because I don't think these are uh, final conclusions. And I'm also not a friend of uh, strict definitions. So um, I'm very friend of uh, trying to understand things and highlight some aspects which could help uh, to further, uh, because defining process for me is a very continuous process. It uh, starts and never ends because things change and they don't stop. So, so far about um, definition and uh, which camp I belong to. And another question was on, uh, sorry, I, ah, the, the examples. Um, yes, um, as I said, we have diverse examples, but we have uh, uh, the same interests, I said. If you could, if you you asked me to bring some kind of concrete examples uh, where we could maybe uh, look at some differences, well, if I bring this kind of very uh, different context, you have a um, um, uh, labor brought from Poland to Germany, Ill, Ill, not illegally, semi-legally, let's say. Uh, so, so, so this uh, example of posting labor, I think it's called posting labor. So, and then if you consider uh, uh, undocumented uh, labor uh, from Central Asia in Russia, I think the, there are some similarities in uh, documentation in the informal practices that are, that are uh, organized um, through Pasredniki uh, or um, middlemen and um, through applying both uh, legal and semi-legal means, I think, but you have still some differences in the, uh, in the, how these things are organized, but you have a lot of similarities. Um, these are the examples that I can bring just very quickly, but I think uh, you can find many other examples in our book, which are really interesting also, but thanks. Well, very interesting question. Professor Knox. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Turaiva. Um, I was just wondering, you started off by saying that your book was multidisciplinary in nature. 
And I was wondering, you know, what additionally did you find as a result of that multidisciplinary, that multidisciplinary approach to informal practices, migration and mobility that you, you have not found in your own disciplines? Well, I think, um, I don't know um, if I can um, rightly uh, answer your question, what I found, what I didn't find before. And I, as I said, we are not inventing a new wheel in this book. Uh, we are, what, what, how we are different from other books already, Dina uh, nicely <laughs> also said that uh, uh, there is a lot of literature on informality and also huge uh, literature on migration and mobilities. I mean, I already uh, listed some of the literature existing also from other disciplines, not only on anthropology, um, but what I said, what we are doing in the book is we are trying to um, look at this link between mobilities and informality, which was not, uh, maybe there is some uh, exactly the same or similar approaches, which maybe I didn't come across. Uh, I will be very much uh, happy to hear about this kind of references because we are obviously, uh, the, our work didn't stop with this book, obviously, uh, since we are uh, still publishing and working together on the similar topics. Um, but what, what in this book we tried to do is, uh, and what our contribution was, that we didn't invent any kind of uh, new theory or uh, didn't uh, provide any kind of new definition, but we tried to at least look systematically um, into some aspects within the link between informalities and mobilities. And um, we also define mobilities uh, very generally where uh, you include not only migration, but also generally mobilities, because we believe that uh, mobilities as also authors of mobility turn uh, argue also that um, this approach to mobility is that we critically reconsider um, any concept that we use because um, mobility obviously and change is very difficult to grasp. And that's kind of a starting point um, in defining our approach to mobilities and informalities. I don't know if, if this answers yes. your question. But yes, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Professor Carini, last question. Uh, Dr. Treva, thank you very much, very interesting. Sorry for my provocative question, but I was wondering if there will be a sequel to this work. The what? world has not uh, promised us that there will be say? no more conflict areas, but uh, I wonder if uh, you are thinking about um, work that will look into the future of issues related to informality and migration across contexts in the future that are a follow-up to, to, to the book. Thank you very much. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question because obviously, um, as I said, um, from the very beginning, our approach is that uh, this is not finally defining, but it's a, a, as a, a starting point for further conversation. And I'm, I'm sure um, that, I mean, uh, my co-editor uh, or co-author, uh, he just, uh, with another uh, colleague of ours who also is contributing to our book, they just um, uh, published another book comparing uh, Central Asian migration uh, to Russia and to Turkey, which is uh, bringing mm -hmm. the uh, similar thinking further uh, and bringing more examples from Turkey, which is really uh, very empirically rich. I really recommend it. It's already available for download. Um, so the, the conversation doesn't stop, didn't stop, isn't stopping. So we are meeting um, again, uh, with some of the contributors and with new contributors and new scholars, um, again in Lund University in uh, July, in 2nd of July, to discuss further um, the same processes, obviously. Uh, so we really hope that uh, we continue our conversation. And, um, if I may, would that work be uh, centered around the area where you have already done your research or with implications for other contexts as well? 
surely Sorry. it yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no no uh, very uh, uh, good question uh, no of course not um, i mean uh, i just finalized uh, my research with my second book on russia uh, Rustam Jan uh, just um, got his out his book on uh, migration in, in Turkey and Russia, and we will we we are planning to. Um, we, I cannot just now uh, just tell you another yeah, title yeah. Sorry, of I mean, the spot. <laughs> but, um, but but I can tell you at least that um, South um, Southeast Asia, for example, and mm -hmm. migration to uh, um, Japan, South Korea. Yeah. Um, and these countries, for example, where our uh, colleagues are coming to discuss with us are going to be uh, the next step and next uh, uh, comparative material, which are going to be uh, continuing to contribute with more examples, with more countries, with more regions, of course. Okay, thank you. Congrats. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. I'll ask a question, Ricardo. Go ahead, Professor Howie. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Tereva. Um, I just have a counter argument. Um, how is informality in second jobs deterring mobility in Central Asia? Which kind of jobs, sorry? Uh, informality in second jobs. Like, so not your primary job, but a lot of people in Central Asia hold more than one job. Mm -hmm. They hold a, job, a formal principal job and they also hold an informal secondary job. Mm -hmm. So have, what about the, so how does that informality actually deter mobilization? Because it's, it's very prominent in, this, in Kazakhstan because I, I know it from looking at the labor force survey and also household budget survey. So they indicate that they're working in the informal sector. Um, so in general, how much, the, the, you're, you're saying yes, informality leads to mo mobilization, but what about informality that doesn't lead to mobilization because of the uh, opportunities for second, second job employment? Thanks, Peter. I think uh, you must understand uh, mobility, I guess. Uh, it was not about mobilizing, um, it was about mobility. Mobility is about uh, mobile lives, about okay. mobile labor, about, uh, yeah, mobile labor, mobile life. And these are examples that are, we are dealing with. Okay. And we considered the examples where uh, with when mobilities, that mobilities are very uh, complex processes where yeah. existing state structures or, or borders or boundaries somehow start to blur and that's what we um, try to analyze. Of course, okay. our examples include uh, uh, both internal, international migration or um, seasonal migration also. I mean, mm -hmm. so we are dealing with uh, mobile people who are crossing different national boundaries and um, active with um, different, very diverse economic projects. And that's what we consider. I think you talked yeah, well, about I'm mobilization. Thinking more of, I'm, I'm thinking more of like international uh, mobilization of labor, like going from, let's say, from, <coughs> from Kazakhstan to Russia or from Uzbekistan or Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan to Russia. And, the, oppor and then the opportunities of these individuals to have actually second jobs, like informal second jobs in their countries that, that lead them not to, to go to move internationally to or it's either permanent or seasonal is seasonally. Because I, I know from my experience, um, not so much with Uber, but pri previously with gypsy taxis, I was picked up by many people in, that had this was their second job. And mm -hmm. these people were professionals. Mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. this is what they were doing. Also, people working on kiosks, um, and this was mm -hmm. their second job, and their kiosks were more informal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Informal. So mm -hmm. there, there's, there's, you know, as you say, the, there's the opportunities that informality provide, and there, some of them are positive. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
as I said, I don't, um, um, I don't, um, Dina asked me yeah. to which camp I belong, <laughs> if I belong to a positive camp of informality or negative, I said, none of the camps <laughs> I don't belong, because as you said already, that um, if you look at informal economies, um, of course, um, the, the informal practices uh, are prone to uh, give more chance to exploitation, to uh, people working without insurances in all those, uh, what you mentioned as second jobs, which are informal, uh, wherever you have informal relations, you have always uh, the space for power relations, dependencies and patron client relations and abuse and of course, but of course this also, uh, as you yourself uh, now mentioned that this also offers uh, uh, opportunities, which obviously uh, keep them at their places because obviously in Central Asia, uh, very many people migrate obviously, and uh, many people are seasonal migrants or uh, migrants staying in other countries, obviously. But of course, uh, we also uh, admit that um, those who stay and find um, the uh, employment opportunities at home uh, are also there, of course. And these are also involved within informal sectors. And uh, I mean, the literature on informal economies, as we said, is very huge. And this has both approaches, both positive and negative approaches. So, or as uh, highlighting both negative and positive aspects of the same uh, complex process. Yeah, because the, the research that I've looked at, I'm an economist, so the research I look at is sort of the, the rural urban migration. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times the rural urban migration can in, in a country, uh, intra country, is due to like sort of, you know, econ economic boom. But then mm -hmm. when the economic boom goes away, the people don't return to the farm. They just return to, they move to the informal sector as well. So it's kind of like a, there's, there's this, as you say, there's the opportunities. And I think, you know, this is what people have to consider these, these opportunities and not have such a negative connotation of informality. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 my publication was in uh, where I tried to define the entrepreneurship in the local context. Oh, oh that's hard. <laughs> uh, so that's where I discussed it um, about agency and about yeah. these opportunities and positive sides of innovative sides of the same uh, sector yeah. or fields, if you want. Um, I also considered in my doctoral research on uh, internal migration from rural to urban in Uzbekistan, um, okay. which I mentioned um, okay. my book one. Um, yeah, I Great. totally agree with you. Great. Well, it was enjoyable listening to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for listening. The, the Dr. Duraiva, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation and for a lively discussion uh, with uh, our colleagues. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you also for, to all the participants uh, who found the time to join us. It was a pleasure seeing you all and have you, having you here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much for inviting me. Thank know. you. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.